Well, hello, cherubs. Welcome back. I hope there's at least a few of you who are still hanging in there and still reading the Brixton Brothers case of the case of mistaken identity. Some are swearing on here. We have only got a few more weeks left until school starts. But man, this is the time. If you haven't been reading over the summer, you should really pick it up because you want to be getting your brain back into shape. So you guys, um, we met on Wednesday. and it was, Some of us did. And then your last reading assignment was to read uh, chapter 12, chapter 11 um, on Thursday last week and chapter 12 on Friday, I think, which means we're ready for chapter 13 or Roman numeral XIII. But the two chapters before this, um, Steve was still with Macintosh and Miss Bunt, who we know are librarians, but they're also secret agents in charge of keeping our country secret secret. And they think Steve uh, has been hired to steal those secrets and that he's also a private detective, which we both know both of those things are not true. Nevertheless, they don't believe him. They tie him up in the back of a limo and leave him there. Steve manages to push, his hands are kind of back here, push a bunch of buttons. And he turns on like, it's like a party limo and there's like disco ball and smoke and things like that. And finally, he finds one that opens a window. He gets out and there he is, I can picture him running down the street, uh, all tied up, uh, and he goes to the police station. Smart move, right? Well, apparently not, because as he's at the police station, he's getting ready to tell the chief clumber, uh, the kind of head police guy there, what's been going on. He's a fax machine. The fax machine might not be something that you're even familiar with. We still use them today. It's kind of like with, at, at Woodview, if somebody wants to send us something on paper, they send a fax and it comes to like our copier machine and it just prints out a message there. But that message says, since the librarians are secret agents working for the United States, it's saying that Steve is wanted uh, for treason, uh, that if you're a law enforcement person, you should arrest him on site. So Steve realizes as he kind of listens out the door as the other police officers and Officer Clumber are getting that message that he better better run away from the police now. So he decides to jump out the window from the second story. And that's where we pick it up today on page 73 uh, called Manhunt. We're going to read two chapters here. So if you have your books and you've got them turned to 73. Ready to follow along. Here we go. Manhunt. One thing the Bailey Brothers Detective Handbook doesn't tell you is how fast you fall. Steve plunged downward and collapsed in a pile of wet grass. A sharp pain shot through his left ankle. Roll, Steve thought, quietly groaning. He turned onto his belly then over to his back again. His ankle didn't feel any better. Clumber, Williams, and Rick... Rick, the guy from the beginning of the book, his mom's boyfriend, is also a police officer, appeared in the second floor window. There he is, said Clumber. Get him! The three cops vanished from the window in unison. Steve scrambled to his feet. His ankle gave. There was no way he could outrun the police. But Steve had an idea. And instead of running away from the police, the police station, he ran back toward it. He lifted himself through an open window on the first floor. He was back inside, crouched on a cool tile floor. The room was dark, but the sweet smell of urinal cakes was unmistakable. He was in the men's room. Girls might not know what a urinal cake is, but we'll leave it up to their imagination. Pretty smart move, you think, on Steve's part? All the police are coming out of the building to go try and find him. So he sneaks back into the building where they wouldn't think to look. A few seconds later, Clumber's voice came in from outside and echoed off the walls of the room. Elliot, you check out the kid's house. Nichols, you take Main Street. I'll patrol the neighborhood. What about me? Asked a voice that sounded like Williams. You watch the desk. Steve heard three engines start up and fade away. He peeked out through the window. The front of the station was deserted. Steve gingerly lowered himself back onto the lawn and headed toward a place Clumber hadn't said to look, the beach. 
At night, Ocean Park Beach was completely deserted. Deserted means nothing there, nobody there. It's deserted like a desert. Steve picked his way along the shore by moonlight, scrambling over rocks and splashing through tide pools. He wasn't going anywhere in particular, so after a mile or two, he stopped going anywhere at all. The sea was black and the sand was black, and the waves hitting the beach sounded like a librarian saying, shush. Steve sat on the shore with his arms wrapped around his knees and wondered how his life had become such a mess. The way he saw it, he had three big problems. Big problem number one. A bunch of trigger-happy librarians thought he was a private detective working for a dangerous man. Big problem number two. The Ocean Park Police Department also thought he was a detective and was hunting him for treason. Big problem number three, he had a social studies report due Monday. I wonder if you were in that situation, if that would still be on your mind or not. I think that's kind of the humor of this book. Steve grabbed a handful of sand and let the grains fall through his fingers. He wished that it would stay night forever, that he could sit by himself on the beach in the dark where nobody would find him. He stood up, brushed the cold sand from his legs, and started walking. As his footsteps formed a great circle on the beach, Steve's brain unclouded. He began constructing a big solution. If he found the quilt and unmasked Mr. E, that would get the librarians off his case which would mean the cops would call off their manhunt. And hopefully the whole story would make for a great essay, essay on needlework. That was it. The only way to prove that he wasn't mixed up in this mess was to get mixed up in this mess. If he was going to show everyone that he wasn't a detective, he had to solve this case. But first he needed to pick up the right tools. Steve walked away from the ocean toward his house. That's the end of that chapter. Steve figures the only way out of this. Everyone thinks that I'm this guy who's committed treason, that I stole this MacGuffin quilt that has all our country's secrets on it, and I'm working for this guy called Mr. E. The only way I can get out of this is to figure this whole thing out, is to find the MacGuffin quilt, to find this Mr. E, to prove that I'm not the person they think of. I'm not this person who has this case of mistaken identity. All right. So we do another chapter now. Um, this chapter is called Under Surveillance. We're on page 77. And this is chapter 14. I don't know if, I don't know if they, we do Roman numerals like we used to. I know we don't in fourth grade anymore, but we used to do it in third grade, but I don't think we do anymore. If you look at that number, and I said it's number 14. The X stands for 10. The I stands for 1. And the V stands for 5. If you put those all together, wouldn't that be 16? Not exactly how Roman numerals work. The X is worth 10, the I is worth 1, and the V is worth 5. That's true. But the order is very important. When you have a Roman numeral that's smaller than the Roman numeral next to it, it means subtract that number. So you've got x, 10, 1, i, is less than v, 5, so it's 5 minus 1, which is 4, 14. I figured you were curious about that. Chapter 14. The bus was parked right in front of Steve's house. A great white thing decorated with rainbows and stars. A parade of brightly painted figures adorned the vehicle's side. There was a smiling butterfly, a bespeckled worm, and a teddy bear who held a book in one hand and a basketball in the other. All these creatures danced under the word bookmobile. In the orange glow of the street light, the animals looked menacing. Steve stared at the bus. This was bad news. You could probably fit at least 10 or 15 librarians in there, and they were watching Steve's front door. 
don't think we have these as much anymore, but we used to have bookmobiles like this. Librarians would come around and they'd be full of books and they'd go to different places, kind of like an ice cream truck almost, only full of books where kids could come and check out books. Anyway, bottom of the page, Steve smiled. He knew another way into his house. Crouching low, he climbed over his neighbor's fence and hustled to their backyard. From there, he hopped another fence and landed on his back porch. Finally, Steve crawled in through a kitchen window. His mom always forgot to lock it. Steve, once Steve was inside, he stood still and listened. The house was small and its walls were thin, and Steve knew every noise in the night. He heard the dull buzzing of the refrigerator, the soft ticking of the wall clock in the living room, and the steady drip of the bathroom faucet. A note was sitting on the kitchen counter, illuminated by sunlight. Steve, Steve strained to read it. Steve, the police say you're in trouble. I am with Rick looking for you. If you're reading this, call my cell phone. The police can help you. I love you. Love, Mom. Steve grabbed a pen from the top of the microwave and turned the paper over. He wrote, Dear Mom, I won't be home this weekend because I'm wanted for treason and I have to clear my name. Also, I took the last can of Sprite from the fridge. Love, Steve. Steve put the note on the counter, took the last Sprite from the fridge, and tiptoed to the bottom of the stairs. Everything he did, he did quietly. The librarians could have this place bugged. Steve was very good at moving silently through his house. He was always sneaking around at home, practicing the Bailey Brothers' methods of stealthy sleuthing. Steve stood at the bottom of the stairs and looked up. The hall of the stairwell was lined with pictures of Steve. Steve graduating from preschool. Steve dressed up like Sean Bailey for Halloween. No one had dressed up as Kevin. A sheep eating Steve's hair at a petting zoo. There was only one empty spot on the wall where Steve's seventh grade picture had hung until he took it down and destroyed it in the backyard. Steve crept upstairs avoiding the 4th, 7th, and 12th steps. Those were the ones that creeped. When he got to the top, he turned left and gently opened the door to his room. He reached under his pillow, pulled out a flashlight, and turned it on. The Bailey Brothers Detective Handbook says every detective should have a working flashlight. You can use it to see in the dark and whack thugs in the gut. Next, Steve opened his desk drawer and pulled out his magnifying glass. The glass was almost as big as Steve's palm, and its handle was made of brass. His mom had given it to him last Christmas. According to the handbook, a magnifying glass is the most important tool a detective owns. Steve wasn't sure why. Probably just for looks. He slipped it into his pocket. Finally, Steve slipped his hand under his mattress and felt around for the Guinness Book of World Records. He opened it up and took out his black notebook. That was the third thing every detective needed. Starting tonight, he'd be filling his notebook with real clues and theories, not just lists of his favorite books. Steve tossed the notebook and the flashlight into his backpack. As an afterthought, he threw the secret book box in there too. Then he slipped out of his room. Just as Steve was about to, about to round the corner at the top of the stairs, he heard a noise. Not a loud noise. Worse, a very soft, very slight noise. Something was amiss. Steve peeked around the corner. In the reflection of one of the picture frames, he saw a shadow move downstairs. Steve tensed. Someone was in his house. Steve tiptoed into his room and gently shut the door. He slid his backpack off his shoulder, slowly unzipped the main compartment, and took out his flashlight in the handbook. He was going to have to exit through a second floor window again, but this time he wasn't going to jump. Making your own rope. Rope is useful. You can use it to pull loot from a well or to lower yourself from tall places. If you jump from up high and forget to roll, 
you could end up hurting your ankle or worse. Here's a clever tip. When Sean and Kevin don't have a rope, they make one by tying bed sheets together. The best knot for the job is a sheet knot, and it's a breeze to tie. Now you see the steps for making that knot. Steve stripped the quilts and sheets from his bed and tied them together, trying to follow the instructions from the book. In a matter of minutes, he had a rope long enough to reach the ground. He went over to his bedroom window, cracked it open, and tossed out the sheets. The white cloth cascaded down to the yard below. He tied the end of his quilt to the bedpost and gave it a tug to test it. It held. Perfect. And that's when his bedroom door swung open. The light flipped on. It was Macintosh. We meet again, Stephen, he said. It's Steve, said Steve, and I was just leaving. Steve backed toward the window. I believe you have our book, Macintosh whispered fiercely. I checked the book out, said Steve. It's mine for 21 days. It's been recalled. Hand it over. I'd love to, but I'll need it to solve the case. Macintosh sneered. I thought you weren't a detective. I'm not, but you're solving the case. Right. What are you doing back home? Grabbing my magnifying glass and some stuff. Grabbing your magnifying glass? Yes. But you're not a detective? No. There was a pause. Macintosh frowned. Steve bit his lip. Well, good night, Macintosh, said Steve finally. He gave a small salute, grabbed on to his quilt, and stepped backward out the window. Almost immediately, the knot on the bedpost slipped loose, and Steve plummeted to the ground. I always liked the little... I'll use the word interjects, interjections of humor in there. Steve thinks he's got this great thing all worked out. So kind of kind of cool, gonna go out his window and the knot comes loose and he plummets to the ground. So all right. Well, that that's that for today's reading. You have a reading assignment tomorrow, which is to read the next two chapters on your own. And then if you're able on Wednesday, we'll get together at 3 o'clock uh, for a Zoom meeting and do a couple chapters there. If you guys are still enjoying your summer, I know that I am getting kind of ready to get back at it a little bit with my new class. Um, so hope that you're reading at least that book. If that book isn't grabbing you, I hope you're reading at least something else. And uh, hope to see you guys on Zoom here in a couple of days. See you later.